go. When did you find this? Just in the shovel test a minute ago. Really? Mm-hmm. How many of these are you finding on a regular basis? Um, not very many. There's so much more to archaeology than the artifact itself. The artifacts are nice, right? But it's the story that that artifact can tell you based on where it is in a site that's the real treasure. Today's story is the mystery of the Swift Creek and Weedon Island people. We've started to notice a pattern. The Swift Creek sites that were there previously, they would be abandoned. And nearby, a new ring midden village area and mound would be built. Why is that? Why didn't they go to a different place? Why did they occupy the same, virtually the same area, uh, but moved it just a few feet in some cases? The interesting thing is looking at radiocarbon dates, at sites all across the area, this shift seems to occur fairly rapidly in the 7th century AD. So, all at once in Northwest Florida, people picked up and moved their villages a few feet away. To find out why, we head down to the refuge. Burg Hammock and Spring Creek Ring Middens and Mound Field Ring Midden are all located on the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. A couple of miles from here is the Bird Hammock Archaeological Site. So this is the remnants of uh, what we would call a Weedon Island burial mound. We've been doing a lot of work in the area of Northwest Florida, especially along the coast, on these types of sites. Burial mound sites that are usually accompanied by circular or ring-shaped middens or garbage areas. And we found that two major cultural components were building them. One was the what we call Swift Creek, and then the other one was the Weedon Island culture. Every time we found a Swift Creek with the earlier ring midden, we'd find a bigger ring midden right next to it, the Weedon Island one. And, and we find this all over this part of Northwest Florida, all at about the same time. There's this shift going on where people are abandoning their existing village and midden and building a new living area, a new uh, mound and village area nearby. So something's making them do this right around 600, 650 AD. So how do you start to figure out the motives of a people long gone who had no written language? It really is amazing the kind of things that you can get from archeology. span You know, we're working without text, so we're limited to the things that will survive over time in the ground, which is almost like trying to put together a thousand piece puzzle with five pieces sometimes. Well, midden is a, a Dutch word meaning kitchen refuse. We adopted it from early archaeologists. These are the refuse from activities associated with uh, cooking mostly. So this is sort of the signature that's left behind from uh, people that were living here uh, over a thousand years ago. And so just inside this circle, there would be houses, living structures, huts, those kinds of things. They throw their garbage out behind the house and it creates this sort of circular berm that surrounds the perimeter of the village. And that's the signature that's left today for archaeologists to find. That's how we know these sites are here. They made good use of the natural resources available at Wakulla Beach. Lots of shell, oyster shell predominantly, but other shell as well. Here's a conch. Piece of pottery, broken piece of pottery. Their pottery, and how it changed over the centuries, provides a bigger clue. The Swift Creek people tended to decorate their pottery with stamping. They would uh, stamp intricate designs into the clay before it was fired. So this is an example of simple uh, stamped design. So we have just some basic geometric patterns carved into the wooden paddle. And then they would take the clay and they would smack it over and over again to get the pattern. Next, they would begin coming up with more what we call complicated designs. And then into another transition where they began to make pots that required more time to decorate. The Weed Island people generally incised their pottery, inscribing designs into them or doing punctations, lots of dots and things like that before they fired them. This is a punctated pot. They probably used bird bone or some kind of turkey bone here at the top or even a reed. And then you see them going into even more decorations onto the edges of the pots, showing even like people. So this is the little head of a person. And then when we turn it around, we get the backside of the individual as well. 
The Wheaton Island people had another different aspect to their, their pottery. They had an entire class of ceramics that were only made to go into burial mounds. So this pot probably didn't serve a functional purpose because of all these holes in it. It probably didn't hold any contents. For some of these larger pots, those items could have been buried with somebody. Archaeologists often probably put too much emphasis on ceramics. That we actually you know, take a lot of heat for that sometimes, and deservedly so. It's it's one of the few artifacts that always survives, and so you know we do tend to over overemphasize ceramics somewhat. But with these Wheaton Island mortuary ceramics, it's justified. These are something special. This is not a normal everyday occurrence. Creating an entire class of objects that are just made to be buried in the mound with with the deceased. So something's a little changing a little bit about their afterlife beliefs, about their funeral practices. Um, so that may be one of, the, one of the differences between the two. One of the things we're starting to see with Whedon Island sites is that their mounds may have a solar alignment in relation to the village. In several of the Whedon Island sites that we found, the burial mound would be located in an area so that if you were standing in the center of the plaza in the village, the sun would set behind the mound on the winter solstice. The Wheaton Island people would often bury their pottery on the east side of the mound. It's actually really kind of the southeast side of the mound. That would be the side that the sun would rise over on the summer solstice and shine on it. They wanted a bigger plaza. They changed the way they buried people. And it looks like they oriented their new villages to the sun. But what does it mean? So we might be starting to see the beginnings of a new religious idea with the appearance of these Wheaton Island sites. And, you know, although, you know, a lot of this is speculation and it is based on what we're finding and that kind of, that kind of idea, that, the idea of finding uh, a change in religious ideology, a change in uh, mortuary ceremonies, you know, that's a, a very rare thing to find in archaeology, uh, to be able to recognize things like that without text to go on. In part two, Mike and Jeff predict the location of a Swift Creek village. We anticipated the Spring Creek site. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. Absolutely.